Okay, the other thing that the Rotterdam rules do, which I think is problematic, is they look in places a lot like the Hague-Visby rules, but once you scratch beneath the surface, they've actually changed. And I've already alerted you to one instance, and that's the list of exemptions. If you just skim read it, you'll think, oh, this is just the same as the Hague-Visby, and you will forget that 42A has been left out. Similar thing here, the burden of proof. This we really struggled with for years and years, and there were about five different versions. In the end, it looks a lot like Hague-Visby, so let's go through it. It's that similar table tennis match that you're used to, the ping pong, backwards and forwards. So stage one, the cargo claimant must prove that loss, damage, or delay took place during the carrier's period of responsibility. That hasn't changed. The only thing that's different now is the carrier's period of responsibility is much longer if that's what it's contracted to do. Stage two, carrier has the burden of proof to show that it's relieved of its liability under 17.2 and 17.3. That's the list of exemptions. Stage three, if the carrier manages that, the cargo claimant must then show that there's some, some contributory cause of liability outside the exemptions, or it's got to say, well, it was actually caused by unseaworthiness. And the only difference there that you've got to remember, of course, is unseaworthiness is now for the entire voyage. And then finally, perhaps the carrier might be able to go back and say, well, yes, there was a contributory factor, but it's not attributable to my fault. So superficially, that looks a lot like the hague visby rules. But the major difference is here, and I've added in the question mark and the exclamation marks. You now have the argument that the carrier can make that I'm relieved of all or part of my liability. Under the hague visby rules, you might remember that as long as the cargo claimants could show that at least one of the contributing factors for the loss or damage is outside of the exemptions, the carrier had to pay. That was the rule. Now, it seems the carrier can say, all right, I'm partly liable, but only to 30%. So you're only getting, what does that mean, 30% of the of the threshold. This is an idea from Europe. They didn't like the all or nothing approach of the Hague and Hague Visby rules and they said you have to allow the carrier to plead contributory um, causes. So I think that this is going to cause problems in practice for shippers. Superficially Rotterdam rules look very shipper friendly but I think that this is the Trojan horse. The carriers are going to say all right, yes, it was unseaworthiness, but the unseaworthiness only contributed to 10%. The rest of it was something within the exemptions. I'm not paying for that. Okay, under the old system, we'd say, well, your unseaworthiness still contributed, you're liable. Now we can't do that anymore. So I think there's going to be a lot of litigation over causation factors, and it's going to complicate maritime litigation quite a bit and it's not necessarily going to work in the shipper's favour. This part of, of the Rotterdam rules, I think, is quite carrier-friendly. Okay, again, it's, when it gets rid of hague visby concepts, it replaces them with very complicated um, distinctions. What was good about hague visby it may have been old-fashioned, it may have been blunt, but it was simple. You knew where you stood. So, if there was a bill of lading, you knew it was likely that the hague visby rules would apply, with very few exceptions. If there was a charter party, you knew they wouldn't apply. Dead easy. Much simpler for students and for lecturers. Now it's messy and it's complicated. The main difference is when we came to Rotterdam, um, and this is the round table I was involved in, all of the common law countries tried to say, let's stick with this distinction between bills of lading, we can call them something else, broaden them out, but it works. The Europeans said no, what we're doing here is regulating contracts of carriage, not documents. So the convention has to apply to contracts. 
But then they started chipping away at it and saying, well, obviously not all contracts. So we then said, well, how are you going to know which ones are out and which ones are in? So they've drafted Article 6, which is a total mess. <coughs> Article 6 then goes back and says, despite not wanting to refer to documents, it says the Rotterdam rules don't apply to charter parties. So we could really just have stuck with Hague Visby. But then it says, and also other contracts for the use of a ship or any space therein. Without telling us what that means, does it mean slot charters? Could it mean other things? That's going to be interesting. And then they introduce this further complication, in liner transportation. And liner transportation is loosely defined as where the shipping services are regular and they're advertised to the public. So there's another nightmare of definition. They only apply to non-liner transportation when there's no charter party and there is a transport document. Are you confused already? Yes, I am too. And I think the judges are going to be as well. So this is a lot more complicated um, than under Hague Visby. Then they go on to say volume contracts, and we'll meet them in the next slide under the ugly. They say they are covered, but the parties can opt out. So you now have the possibility that uh, a further category of contracts is in, but they can actually contract out. Messy. Okay, let's meet, uh, no, let's meet volume contracts. This is a totally new concept, and this is the Americans' fault, I'm afraid. Um, they pushed this very heavily. Their, their shipping federations wanted this um, quite badly. What is a volume contract? Well, that was the million dollar question. Um, it's defined in the Rajdan rules as a carriage contract for a specified quantity of goods maximum, minimum, or range in a series of shipments during an agreed period of time. I can see I've, I've left off the last inverted commas. We found another mistake, Professor Ty. Um, so that's the definition. The problem is it's not much of a definition. As the European Council of Shippers has pointed out, well, if I agree with a carrier to ship a single container say maybe you know, uh, stuff I've, I've developed in a warehouse, and six months later to ship another container, is that a volume contract? In other words, how many containers and how many shipments does it take to make a volume contract? There's no guidance under the Rotterdam rules. Um, what the Rotterdam rules say is that they apply to volume contracts, but the parties can contract out provided they follow the rules in Article 80. Article 80 sets down quite detailed rules. Basically, you can't do it by standard form contract. It has to be properly negotiated. You can't do it by reference. It has to be properly notified. But basically, if you decide you've got a volume contract, you meet the requirements of the definition, you can opt out of the Rotterdam rules. In all other cases, it's what we're used to. The parties can't contract out. Any attempt to do so would be void. So it's the good old Article 3.8 under the hague Visby rules. So there's this funny beast called the volume contracts. Now, why do we have it? Well, the definition doesn't really give it away, but the background politics is this. The shipping federations in the US are basically dominated by the big players, like Walmart and the other um, massive American companies. When they ship their goods, they don't do it under a traditional shipping arrangement. They go to a carrier and get a service agreement with them. And already, whether it's Hague, Hague, Visby or Hamburg, basically the understanding is that the carrier will provide the service these big boys require, and um, they'll sort it out if they, they muck up. So they're already operating outside of the rules. But what has changed is they can now do so on a legal basis. So these large corporations now can completely remove the minimum requirements of the Hague, Hague Visby, or Hamburg rules by opting out under Rotterdam. So for the first time, we've got a maritime carriage regime which is not fully mandatory. 
these big players can opt out of it. The difficulty, though, is that the small players can't. If you're not a volume contract, the Rotterdam rules apply. It's compulsory. You can't contract out. It's just the big players. All right.